you so much. Uh, when you're sitting at the front, the crowd doesn't look big. <laughs> and then you get up here, and it's, it doesn't take a lot to convince the lawyer to come and speak. So I want to begin with expressing some uh, some uh, gratitude to some wonderful people involved in all of this. So I want to begin with, first of all, thanking the uh, Western Center for uh, Research and Migration on Ethnic Relations. I think they do incredible work. Just this, the, the title itself says so much. It's very powerful. Uh, as well as the South London uh, Neighborhood Resource Center. They're the most I've been connected with uh, because of uh, specifically two individuals, Amani Raya, and she's right there, and Mohammed uh, Ladeni. Those two guys are the troublemakers that got me uh, to speak at this event. So thank you so much to both of you. And thank you to Alina and Sunali. No one's mentioned you, but you guys showed up in my office and uh, made me feel important in front of a camera. So thank you so much. Um, what I want to begin with is, uh, while we're encouraged to speak about our story as it relates to you know, where we come from, uh, and by that I really mean our subjective perception of what happened. It's a bunch of events, and if you, if you speak to my family members, Every single one has their own subjective interpretation of what happened. Uh, that's essentially what it is. And when I'm speaking about it today, I know we have 15 minutes, I want you to, to uh, really take one message from all of that. And that is that uh, it is what we make of our journey and the opportunities and the people, uh, people uh, and the efforts of those people that defines the journey. Not the journey per se, in my respectful opinion. And I think we are a product of that journey. And I, I want you to all keep, uh, keep that um, uh, in your mind uh, when I speak about the rest of the things that took place to uh, get here. Our story isn't, and I'll be blunt and frank, it's not um, unique. It's not new. It's not extraordinary. It's not special. And I say that because since we've come here, and I looked at some stats since 90, 91, we left, 93 we arrived. Millions and millions of refugees have been displaced, have been pushed out involuntarily, pushed out of homes that they've made their home for hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of years. So it, what we talk about today, what we uh, personally at least, is not uh, unique. I, I just want uh, to emphasize that, not because it's not important, but it happens all the time and it's a sad part of uh, the world that we're living in, and at the same time, we have to look at, and I mentioned this earlier, we have to keep in mind what we make of that journey. That's the critical point of all that. And I, context is important. I, I, someone mentioned it earlier, international treaties you have to think about, international conventions, all of this stuff is triggered the moment people begin migrating, right? Cities, uh, nation, city, state, international nation states have legal obligations. All of those are triggered, and I really want you to think about, about that stuff when you're watching uh, the news about the refugees and migrants. Every single uh, uh, nation state has an obligation, and that's where the legal obligations kick in, and I think it's so critical to keep that in mind and uh, to think about why are these nation states acting up. Our story begins in 91. So 91 is when Saddam Hussein or earlier than that, decided to invade Kuwait. And in 91, he was defeated. And there were uprisings in Iraq, in the north and in the south. And so somehow they allowed him to utilize his military equipment again to uh, suppress all of that. And so fear and panic spread through Iraq. My parents are here. My dad and mom, there were nine kids at the time. And so here you have a uh, very poor family thinking about what the hell do we do? How do we get up and leave with nine kids? And it's not like you have a van or a car to get into. So in 91, we took off, just like everybody else was. And we lived in northern Iraq, called Zafo, which is closest to Turkey. And that story right there, here's what the incredible part of that is. Our neighbor was a bus owner. My dad will remember this. We had no way to get to our destination quickly enough. Our mother was frail. As I mentioned, uh, nine kids all under the age of 15. The bus had already been occupied by a wealthy family. And he said, don't worry about that. Get on there and we'll get to our destination. So that's a very important part of the story. Again, that I mentioned, the, the, the beauty of the, uh, of the journey is the people, are the people involved. 
And so from there, we eventually ended up um, arriving at a location and the rest of the journey was walking through the mountains and different valleys and regions and arriving in Turkey. And arriving in Turkey and again at the borders, there's a legal obligation to allow refugees in. So it was a mass, um, just like what we're seeing right now. So we entered Turkey and after a little bit of uh, brief uh, uh, removals from different areas, we settled in a refugee camp and we literally lived in a tent for two years. Okay, so you have a camp, uh, some people you know, some people you don't know, and we lived there for two years. And when you think about all the international aid discussion, the funds, the money that's flying around, it ended up there. We saw the logos, we didn't know what they meant at the time, but food was rationed out to different families. Um, we had a brother that was born there, so he's the youngest. He's a, he's a true refugee. He was, he was born right in a tent, actually. <laughs> and, uh, and he doesn't brag about it. So, which is, <laughs> so anyways, while you're a refugee, uh, there are interviews. The United Nations is facilitating interviews with families to be accepted. Eventually, we're accepted to Canada. I think my dad has a story. I don't know if it's true or not. Uh, or maybe I can't remember it right. He said, we were interviewed by Australia. We got accepted. They said you gotta pay for your flights eventually, and he's like, get out of here, I can't pay for that. And then we got accepted to Canada, and we ended up paying our flights. So there we go, afterwards. So it's, it's a monthly kind of payment, which is, uh, it's a cheaper. blessing. What? It'd be cheaper. I don't know if it was cheaper, but it was a blessing nevertheless. <laughs> so eventually we were accepted, and how we were accepted was like this. We had speakers throughout the refugee camp, and I remember I was in a portable classroom, and they're reading out names, and when they're reading out names, you just freeze and listen. And I remember they called our name, and I was like, yes, the hell with school, I'm out of here. And I took off home, at the time I was 11, so I, you know, I didn't appreciate it as much. So I took off home, and we knew that we were accepted to Canada, when we were gonna be uh, leaving the refugee camp, and it was a bittersweet feeling, of course. Family, friends, and yet there's a destination waiting for us, so that was, an incredible um, moment in our life. But the refugee camp, you know, we had to create a life there. There was a marketplace, neighbors, people had their mini gardens. My dad is a great gardener. And, you know, everyone, you know, it's a human instinct. You have a bit of, a, you have a small lot and you do as much as you can to make it a home. And everyone had their own character on that tent. It's we had a beautiful tent, actually. And uh, my dad and mom did a fantastic job. I think they're the true, incredible humans. So while in a refugee camp, they did their best to make it as comfortable as possible. And part of that was the international community. You know, again, I want to go back to that. You guys paying your high taxes and the government sending it overseas, thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. It made it to our um, stomachs. You know, we got the fruits, we got the rice, etc. So uh, really that's another thank you uh, to, to all of you here as well. So when we were accepted, we didn't know much about Canada, of course. We knew we were going to this magnificent destination. Um, we thought we were gonna arrive in Toronto and stay there. I think that's the only thing we knew. So we arrived in Toronto in 1993 and immediately they, were, they told us to get an advance and you're gonna be going to London. It was a bit of a shock, but that was one of the greatest decisions made for us. And we arrived at a place called the Global House. Global House. And this is a place where you were at, uh, house refugees. There were different families. So we arrived here, you got 10 kids under the age of now 17, 18. And it, in, in, this, in, in this beautiful neighborhood, this is, I, I, I love it to this day. We're talking about the East Village now uh, in London here. Um, and we arrived at a, a global house. We were housed comfortably, welcomed with love, fed comfortably, and I got some jokes on that as well. Connected with different agencies and people. You know, this was an effort, a collective effort by the community to make us as comfortable as possible in our new surroundings and uh, to kind of make us transition slowly. And you know, the first reactions that we had were initially on the highway, the 401. It's beautiful little mountains, I thought at the time. And, uh, but uh, it, it, initial reaction, walking around the neighborhood, everything is new, everything was exciting. Um, 
the structure of homes, the people you speak to, and it was so peaceful. You walked around, uh, people mind their own business. Not that, not that we did, did back home, but it was more relatives around us. But it was such a beautiful, pristine, brand new feeling that we had. And all of us experienced that. And again, if you speak to each of us, again, it's that subjective perception of what we experienced in that neighborhood. That, so that was our prison, prison in the sense that that's what we saw that neighborhood. And it was a magnificent area that we lived in. And when you're in a new land, there's new things to taste and touch, etc. And back home, we didn't have uh, many bananas. So in the global house, they had a lot of bananas. And we were, a lot of us were kids, so we would eat these things nonstop. And uh, we'd have fights with the cooks. She'd say to my parents, are your kids going to eat? And they said, they're full. And she, they would say, well, stop eating the bananas, for crying out loud. Uh, and then the pizza as well. They'd serve us with a pizza. We couldn't, we didn't really understand pizza, so we'd peel off everything. We loved bread with tomato paste on it. <laughs> and we thought that was the greatest treat that you can get time and again. Here's just another story that I remember in that neighborhood. And that is me and my brother were walking. I remember seeing cops and the police station is in that area. And I vividly remember saying to my brother, just walk cool, you're okay, we're good, we're good, we're okay, they're just, they're not gonna do anything to us. And it, right, it's that memory planted from back home. You've got certain authority, they've got guns, be careful. And then eventually we realize they are wonderful human beings doing wonderful things in our community. So as you can tell, everything was exciting. I mean, that's really the message that I can tell you. And all of that is a product of these, this wonderful community that you've built, the wonderful human beings involved in the community, the agent, agencies, and on and on. All of that came together in this holistic picture to create this welcoming and loving environment that we were introduced to. And today, so, there was 10 children and mom and pops. Today we have people working in the government, uh, finances, we have business, owner, business owners, uh, and many, many grandkids. And I can tell you this, a few people asked us, where's your family? And I said, you know what, if they showed up here, there wouldn't be any room for you guys. So there's a good reason they didn't show up. There's 18 grandkids since we came to Canada. And so, and they all have grown up healthy, uh, and appreciated of, of what a wonderful place this is. And I want to say this to you guys in Canada. I think uh, we've done a good job of showing the Canadian government that we were decent investment from that standpoint, that you invest in a family, in, a, in, 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 a, in, in children that have aspirations, and you'll get some wonderful results. And I hope we've done a good job of doing that. There were some, there were some uh, questions as well about challenges and opportunities dreams and aspirations. I have never, ever sat down with my family and talked about challenges per se. Weeks, you know, coming where we come from, and many of you here have a similar story. It's not really a challenge. It's just a part of the process to uh, learn the country, uh, accept the wonderful values that have been uh, provide, provided to us here. And so from that standpoint, other than your standard linguistic challenges. There wasn't a real challenge. You, know, you have the usual, you gotta work hard, accumulate some money and buy a home and et cetera. Beyond that, it was an incredibly welcoming community from day one to this day. And some of the families that we made uh, friends with at the time are still some of our best friends to this day. And in terms of uh, my dreams and aspirations, uh, you know, it's a, a lot of people say this, but I'll say to you, when I grow up, I do want to be something else. Uh, but I think I've done my best to do what I have done, which is um, be the first one in my family to come to university, which was Western. I still like to say UWO, so I don't know why they played with that name. Um, and then after me, my brothers and sisters graduated as well, four of them. All of this, I really want to go back to my point. All of this is a product. We are a product <coughs> of you guys and the community and the wonderful values that you instill in um, and how you, <coughs> how you act in the community. We see all of that. We feel all of that. And I really want to convey that message to you guys. 
I'm a 14 minutes bang on. And I really want to convey the message to you guys. It's not it, the story that we have, and I know it's a refugee story, it's, a, it's the same one. It's a mass exodus, displacement, for, an involuntary uh, displacement. It is a similar story, but it's what you make of that journey to truly showcase how appreciative you are of uh, the efforts that have been put into our lives. So, and I want to thank my parents, Sarah and Salim, they're right there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one more thing, I think my time is up. Two of my nephews, born here, are in the city football championships and they're playing at TD Waterhouse right now. <laughs> and my sister and my um, sister-in-law are there as well. And they, but the rest of the kids, right? So it's not incredible, they're right there and we've got our own little uh, um, challenge going on here as well. So thank you so much. I hope that's enough in terms of time. And I really want to thank all of you for being here. All of you have a, I, I think there are so many people more qualified to be a, a peer than I am. So I, 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 am, I am humbled by this. I'm grateful. And I want to thank you so much for this. Thank you.